since Kosi is, oh my God. Christo friends, welcome back to Opus LNI where we finish our projects. <laughs> Today I am doing something a little bit different since Kosi is coming up a little bit more quickly than I actually feel adequately prepared for. Some of us costumers have decided to make 21 questions videos as sort of a get to know you thing for people who may be finding us just after Kosi. I did do a similar video last year. I'll link it in the cards, I guess, and in the description, but there are a lot more of you now than there were a year ago. Today I'm going to be answering some questions and trying to finish up this washed silk dress that I started making a couple of years ago and then made the mistake of actually wearing to an event before the garment was finished and that always spells disaster because I, once I wear it it's done. I never want to go back and finish it or tweak it or anything like that. So I am taking this opportunity to put in at least a back gore to this. Um, it's a rectangularly, a rectangularly, rectangularly, it's a rectangularly constructed dress and it just has the side gores in. I didn't put any front and back gores in and I want a little bit more fullness around the hem so I'm going to at least put in the back gore which will mean cutting it. I will go ahead and answer some questions, ramble on. Um, you can see how long this takes me kind of in real time. I guess here we go. Everyone go grab your cuppa. Um, today I'm just drinking water because it's summer in Texas. Everyone hydrate, I guess, and we'll get into it. So when I was little, I lived um, just a couple of miles away from my local Renaissance festival. And it was not even a Renaissance festival, it was more like a medieval fair. Apologies for Bran screaming in the background, he is angry that I am filming instead of paying attention to him. So this particular medieval fair was sort of based on King Arthur, the King Arthur stories. And you know, it, it kind of was, but it kind of wasn't. We had our own little spin on it. And I fell in love with it so hard. I went every single year. Then at about 14, I started being old enough to work there. And it turns out, Renaissance Festival clothes are effing expensive. So I, I made my grandmother teach me how to use a sewing machine and I made myself a very Renaissance Festival-y chemise. Had no bearing in any kind of uh, historicity or anything like that. And I have never looked back since. All right. This one has nothing to do with historical costuming. It has more to do with kind of a pseudo, pseudo cosplay, I guess you could say. Not far from my house is a gravel processing plant. And when it's windy, oh, I need thread. Let's use that one. All right, so not far from my house is a gravel processing plant. And when it is windy over there, all of the dust from the gravel kind of goes everywhere and it's in the middle of kind of these big fields. All of the vegetation gets coated with this gravel dust and it's, you know, kind of this grayish white sort of sickly color. And so everything looks just incredibly post-apocalyptic and it would be so cool to go over there and just have like this sort of Mad Max kind of post-apocalyptic photo shoot, which I guess would mean that I'd have to make some kind of Mad Max cosplay or something, which, you know, is fine. I guess I would. I don't think I'm quite built to be Furiosa, but I, I could be one of the wives because, you know, Fury Road is the best Mad Max. I will not be taking questions at this time. It's kind of a, it's kind of a tough one. Generally speaking, it's the last project that I've worked on in any given at any given time. Usually when I am making things, I 
feel very accomplished. Something about them makes me feel very accomplished. And I am proud of that particular accomplishment, whether that's getting the fit right on something or learning a new technique or having had a project finish and be what I want it to be in my head. It, they're not all that deep or whatever. The, the couple most recent are the block printed dragon is probably the one that I would say right now that I'm, I'm most proud of because that was a project that had been a long time in the making and probably the one that I was iffiest about how the execution was going to go because I had not block printed in so long and it went how I wanted it to and looked how I pictured it in my head and my partner was so very pleased with it. So yeah, probably that one. Although, you know, honestly, the Kustrop dress, again, I wasn't sure how that one was gonna go because I've never really, I mean, I've done some smocking, obviously. I've done, I've done the smocked aprons and stuff, but I had never done that kind of cartridge pleating and gathering and it, it ended up fitting exactly how I wanted it to fit. It looked exactly how I wanted it to look. So that between the way that that project was executed and also the message that it had behind it in terms of pride being a thing that has been becoming increasingly important to me on both a philosophical and a personal level, I'm really happy with that one too. So probably those two are, are the things that I'm really most proud of. a medieval costumer. I work with shapes. So I, I guess technically draft? Since that's kind of flat patterning, I guess. Everything starts with shapes. It's all rectangles and then triangles and then trapezoids. So, you know, I guess drafting. I have draped a couple of things. My very first Coat Hardy pattern that I ever made myself was draped on a dress form that was not exactly my shape and adjusted by me on my own body, including the back seam. I didn't know how hard that was going to be and I didn't know how hard that was considered by other people because I had no experience at that, so I had no point of reference for that. I just did it because I thought that's just kind of what you did. I guess I could be proudest of that one too. That <laughs> was a pretty big accomplishment. <laughs> I also have used some commercial patterns as well. I actually just recently bought one for a 1790s dress that I am planning to make sometime when I get tired of making more medieval clothes. I'll probably do that. But I generally prefer to buy patterns from indie pattern companies because I find them to be a little bit more meticulously crafted than, than patterns from the big four companies. They tend to come in a, a wider variety of sizing. I, I just prefer them. Right now I have a couple of black snail patterns that I'm really interested in making again after I kind of get tired of making medieval clothes or, uh, or y'all want a break from that, whatever. Yes. I like pins, obviously, for holding together pieces of fabric that I am currently sewing. I don't generally use them when I cut things out. I made these adorable little pattern weights. They're just two washers hot glued together, and then I wrapped them with ribbon. Again, you know, hot gluing the beginning and the end, and they all kind of match. I have another spool of this ribbon, so maybe I'll run to the hardware store and get some more washers or something. I can make like a TikTok of how I make these. That'd be pretty cool. Let me know in the comments if that's something that you'd want to see on kind of a, a more short form video on. I'd like to learn some actual tailoring techniques. Pad stitching and the way that tailoring, like the tailored garments do things like ease seam allowances that are not quite the same in order to create, you know, curves and, and things. I'm thinking specifically of like men's shoulder seams here where usually the back seam, the back shoulder seam is a little 
longer than the front shoulder seam and it's eased in such a way that that creates a gentle curve forward to accommodate like the back of the shoulder and I just think that's so cool and I would like to learn more about that um, it's kind of a low priority right now because so few things that I want to make have those tailoring techniques incorporated within it uh, but I do want to make a doublet I do, I wanna make a couple doublets. I wanna make three doublets. I have plans for some, you know, Renaissance Elizabethan late period tailored doublets. And I have Matthew Nagy's book on tailoring in the Renaissance. And so I think, I think probably those are gonna be the projects where I sort of buckle down and dedicate the time to actually learning those things. There are probably two things that are the most satisfying to me. One of them is what I am doing right now, and that is setting gores. I love, I love setting gores. I know it's such a weird thing to love, but I got to a place where I could do it really well, and I worked out a technique that has served me incredibly well. And uh, now I just look forward to it. I'm like, oh, this is this is a piece that has to have a sudden gore. Can't wait. <laughs> and then the other one is probably uh, felling seams. It's not, it's not glamorous. It's not super flashy, but I just love the way that felled seams feel and look in a finished garment. There is something that feels wonderfully handmade about them, but handmade but extra finished, I guess. Yeah, handmade but extra finished. And I really like that. That's probably, it's probably the thing that I end up finding most tedious because by the time I'm like, oh God, I don't want to fell any more seams for the rest of my life ever. But then I put the dress on or the garment on and it just, everything just feels so wonderful about it that I'm always glad to have done it. And it always feels, it's always nice to have a project that I can take with me wherever I happen to be and felling seams is great for that because it's super mindless you don't have to think about it you just have to fold you know one side over the other and then whip stitch them down or whatever however you're stitching them and it just always feels you know I don't want to say authentic that's not the right word because what is authentic even mean who knows but I feel a very deep connection with people who have spent time doing handwork in the past and for some reason felling seams because I do them by hand and generally I do them on the move so it's not me sitting at my sewing machine or you know here or at my computer while I'm you know doing research or, or watching other YouTube videos or whatever. It forges a stronger connection between me and my forebearers who did handwork. And I realized that I have a certain amount of privilege and that I am doing this for fun. I don't need to do this in order to clothe myself or my family, but still there is a meditative quality to it that feels very timeless and I enjoy tapping into that feeling. So that was a really philosophical answer <laughs> about why I love hand felling seams. other than this one that I'm hopefully gonna finish today. I guess we'll see. Because I have this problem that I know I have wherein if I don't finish a project before I wear it, it is, that's as done as it's gonna get, generally speaking. I think I've had this one in my UFO bin for like two or three years now. <laughs> It's so stupid of me to wear it. So yeah, I don't generally do unfinished 
like UFOs because I know that I'll, I'll never finish something if I don't finish it before I wear it. Uh, I still have that Sabriel surcoat that I'm working on. That's also, uh, that ends up being a project where I know if I did a little bit on it every single day, then it would get done in a relatively timely manner. But that also doesn't tend to be how I work on things. Really, I tend to get into like a hyper fixation mode and then I just want to work on one project at a time until I finish. I could do that with the Sabriel surcoat, but that would mean that I would probably have to take a two month hiatus from doing YouTube videos because it is a lot of embroidery that I still need to finish on that. And if I wasn't doing other things as well, then I wouldn't have videos to put out. I have to find some kind of happy medium. All right. Almost halfway done. Almost halfway done. Meow. It is the next day, which you can probably tell by my different clothes and makeup. I lost the light yesterday while I was filming, so I just thought I'd, I'd pick up today instead. I didn't feel like getting out all of the huge umbrella lights and everything, so. Got the first part of this gore sewn down along one side, so I'm just going to go ahead and flip it over and start sewing down the other side. Where were we? I have some plans for the future. I mentioned a little bit earlier grabbing a 1790s pattern. I don't generally wear things. I don't make things unless I have a place to wear them. And most of the venues that I have um, around here are venues for medieval and Renaissance clothing because I'm in the SCA. That's a community that I'm already a part of and I feel familiar with and I know how it works. I don't actually know how many like Regency groups are around here or groups of living history or historical reenactment or even just people who enjoy putting on clothes and getting together and doing picnics and stuff are around here outside of the SCA. I really just don't know. And part of the problem that I have with the idea of living history in America as it is, but specifically in Texas and the South is that a lot of the history that gets really glorified and celebrated here is a history of enslavers and colonizers. I don't want to be part of that without a rigorous educational component. You know, Latina living history, uh, my friend Katie came up with this hashtag of, of no costuming without context as sort of a parallel to vintage style, not vintage values, and in, in that all of the things that we are kind of doing have some really deeply problematic roots. And as a white person myself, it's really incumbent on me to reckon with that particular slice of history and that particular slice of problematic costuming. Uh, I don't want to just ignore all of the history in favor of pretty clothes and I know. Anyway, that said, I, I still do want to do a couple of dresses just to see how they're put together. 1790s, um, 1770s, those things, but again, those are going to have to be on a hold for a little while until I can do that sort of justice, those fashions and that history. Oh, easy, hands down, my thimble. It's a tailor's thimble, so it has an open top. And when I sew, I kind of hold the needle in my two fingers, my finger, my forefinger, and my thumb. And then I use the side of the needle to sort of push it sideways as I'm taking a stitch. I, I really started going hard on my YouTube channel during the pandemic and made the decision that I was gonna start putting out a video every two weeks. And for the most part, I really did. You know, it's allowed me to 
make a schedule that really holds me accountable for what I'm doing and the things that I'm making in a way that sort of replaced my eventing schedule for when we were not in a global panorama. Because then it was, you know, I had to get this particular project done for whatever event I was planning to wear it or present it at. And without those deadlines, I probably would not have been as productive as I have been this year. I was usually not going to events every two weeks. So in some ways, this schedule has led me to be more productive than I would have been outside of the pandemic. But it also means that a lot of my free time is now eaten up by filming and editing and editing and editing and editing. So I don't, maybe it's not such a great trade-off. I don't know, <laughs> but that's how it's affected me. <laughs> probably making videos. I mean, it's a whole new skill set. Not anything I've ever really done before. That, mm, that's not entirely true. I have done some still photography before, so I have like a working knowledge of the exposure triangle and like all of those things, but there's so much more, you know, not even to mention the idea of adding in audio or anything like that. Um, so I think I'm proudest of learning how to make videos this year. Funny you should ask. I actually have a project that's coming up right after Kosi that's going to be a revisitation of one of my old Renaissance Festival costumes. I came across some pictures of me as a wee baby in the Renaissance Festival. I think I was like 17, <laughs> so a long time ago. I try not to be a person who has a lot of extraneous things in terms of tools. I'm not always really great at that, but that means that all of the tools that I have and all of the tools that I use are all great and they're all useful. Probably right now, the thing that I am most glad that I invested in is this table. It's fantastic. It's so sturdy compared to some of the other like folding tables. I put casters on the bottom, even though it didn't come with casters, so I can roll it easily on my crappy apartment carpet. It looks lovely. I really like it. I, it just looks nice. You know, it does everything that I need it to do. It's not quite big enough if I want to lay out an entire hem and, you know, trim the curve at one time. I just still have to do that on the floor, but even still, I love that I can kind of swing it around and sit on my bench in front of it and have it as an extra dedicated sewing working space. So this is probably the thing. I have a, a weird relationship with this question. I think, well, I think I'm just weird and so all of my relationships are weird. But when I started sewing, I was very young. I didn't have a lot of money. You know, I had a, a little like after school job or whatever, but I also had to like buy my own clothes and you know, all of that stuff, anything that I wanted or needed, I needed to buy for myself. Some people would give me things and I felt like I could not say no to free material because it was material that I didn't have before and I was not so able to be choosy in what I had that I could afford to say no to free material. And so when I was in a high school student um, and then I was also, you know, a college student and just, you know, kind of getting into the SCA and, and doing all of that stuff. Anything that anyone ever gave me, I said yes to. Which led to some really weird fabric choices for certain things because it's what I had. I ended up procuring fabrics and then making things to suit those fabrics. And that was sometimes more successful than other times. But because I did not have a lot of money, it meant that when I was deciding on things to buy or make for myself, that I had very specific ideas in mind for what materials I wanted, I had to be strategic in what I ended up buying for myself. So that has kind of carried over. I'm in a better place financially than I was when I was a student, but it still means that I tend to 
have that mindset where I will think of projects and I will have projects in mind when I go material shopping. So I guess that was a really long way of saying that I pick projects and then buy materials instead of the other way around. <laughs> Brand break. Hey buddy, don't knock my stuff over, okay? Yeah, thanks, buddy. gonna be up here and angry at me instead of on the floor and angry at me that's a nice change it's a nice change hi I yes bold of you to assume I pin <laughs> when I'm pinning and I do sometimes I'm actually pinning right now and you can see that the pins are perpendicular to the line of stitching that I'm sewing I generally do this because I have sewn over even though I'm hand sewing right now on the machine I have sewn over too many pins and I have killed machines that way generally I'm pretty careful about taking pins out as I go as I'm sewing because I don't want to break another machine <laughs> a lot of podcasts. I really particularly enjoy slow burn cosmic horror podcasts, um, the Magnus Archives, Old Gods of Appalachia, you know, things like that. But like some true crime stuff as well. Um, I also listen to a lot of audiobooks. I really like urban fantasy. So the Toby Day books by Shana McGuire or like Magic for Liar by Sarah Gailey. I really enjoy like either speculative fiction or fantasy. I'm pretty picky about both. Um, I'm actually really picky about all of the things that I listen to. If I'm watching something, it tends to be something that I'm not going to get distracted by the visuals of. So either something that I've seen a million times before and is just kind of background noise and companionable. Things like Midsummer Murders and other light-hearted British procedural crime dramas? Not really dramas. It's comedy? I don't know. I think in terms of uh, projects, I have so many. I have so many. You know, I have a planning board that I use and it is just chock full of project ideas. I generally have, I think, the rest of this year sort of mapped out and the farther away we get from now, the more subject to change those plans are. But I definitely have, through September, pretty solidly figured out. You know, I have that revisitation of an old Renaissance costume. I really want to get that surcoat done. I have another thing that I want to get finished up for my partner. That's another kind of Halloween costumey inspired thing, so that'll probably go up sometime in October. A few other exciting things, a new coat hardy for my partner's nighting. You know, I made him the tunic and I kind of need something new to wear that's like vaguely 14th century. So I may, I may film that. Um, I need to refit that pattern to me 
So it's been a while since I've made one, so I need to double check and make sure that, that what I have fits. In terms of not project plans, obviously I'm going to be participating in COSI 2021. It's kind of the purpose of this video, so anybody who finds me through that can, you know, get to know me a little bit. For that, I'm going to be doing another capsule wardrobe video since that was incredibly popular. Everybody seemed to really like it last year. This time it's going to be focused on uh, Vikings, so that should be fun and interesting, I hope. Now that I have enough Viking clothing for myself to be able to make a capsule wardrobe, I just have to, you know, bug a couple of my masculine friends to dress up and let me take pictures of them. Also in November, I will be participating in the second annual Tournament of Defense. I mentioned that in another video recently. And I will be one of the material culture track instructors. So I will be doing hands-on demo of how to set gores, but also a brief history of European queerness in, in history. So that should be pretty fun, I hope. Let's see, there will also be some really amazing other teachers on that track, so I will link that in the description box below, also to go see if any of that sounds interesting. <laughs> uh, I encourage you to, to, to participate to whatever level you can, whether that's, you know, watching a bunch of stuff from COSI or, you know, if you're near Bellevue, Texas and having some really fantastic hands-on instruction by me and other people in an actual castle uh, with a feast at the end of the day if that sounds fun like check out the link and that makes 21 so thank you to everyone who kind of sat with me and listened to me ramble while I and you know hopefully you did some hand sewing um, to everyone who finds this video after cozy welcome I hope you stick around if you enjoyed this video I hope that you will like and subscribe if you like getting notifications when YouTube decides to send notifications out, click on the little bell. Uh, you might get notifications, you might not. It's a mystery. If you would like to find me on other social media, I am at OpaSLNI everywhere, uh, including TikTok and Coffee, and I will put the link to all of those accounts as well as my Coffee into the description box below, just in case you'd like to either check out my web shop or you know, toss a couple dollars my way and make sure that I have enough treats to make Bran stop yelling at me while I film. <laughs> Until next time, uh, be kind, do the work, continue supporting marginalized creators, and keep creating. Quill. I don't know what I did or didn't do to make him angry, except that I had the audacity to feed him once today uh, so far. It is still morning. It's 10 o'clock a.m. He gets fed in the mornings and in the evenings, and right now he is loudly eating his dry food so that I know how awful his life is because he only got one bowl of what food this morning. I'm such a monster. <laughs>